Okay, so I just started recording. Uh, hi, Hugh, welcome here with us. Um, Hugh has been a member of the Wales national team. He's also an excellent coach, an excellent uh, judge as well, and also an excellent debater. Um, so now I'll stop talking and I would like to hand it over to Hugh uh, to start the presentation. Fantastic, thank you. I'll just start sharing my screen. Awesome, can I just check that everyone can see this? Yeah, I think it works. Fantastic. Okay, fantastic. So thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm really excited to be doing this presentation and it's a bit of a different sort of lecture from the ones that uh, have happened so far in this lecture series um, because I'm focusing a lot kind of broader um, than one main kind of focus of debating like first speeches, second speeches, third speeches, weighing, rebuttal, building arguments, all that sort of stuff. Um, in this lecture, I'm kind of assuming that that's, uh, you've got that sort of foundational knowledge uh, about debating in the first place. And this uh, kind of conversation is gonna be a lot more about kind of applying that uh, specifically to online debating competitions um, and those sorts of things. Uh, so just before we kind of jump into just that, a um, few bits uh, about me personally, you know, Rhea was uh, has given a bit of an introduction to already. So I was on uh, Team Wales, this debating team uh, in 2018. I was team captain in 2019 and 2020. Um, and we had a pretty good run uh, of both in-person and online competitions uh, in that in that time. Uh, obviously, with 2020 being the, the online competitions of those. Um, it's worth noting we lost very clearly to uh, a very strong Slovenian uh, World Schools team uh, in 2019. Um, so I witnessed uh, firsthand the, uh, the strength of the, the circuit that you've got at Slovenia. Um, and I'm really happy that you guys have invited me to talk a bit about online debating with you uh, this evening. Um, I've also done quite a bit of judging uh, only in the, the online format this year and last year. Um, so I've hopefully I'm in a relatively good place to be able to see what's different and what's similar and some tips and tricks to apply to online competitions that are different from in-person ones um, and as Rhea pointed out we've also started coaching uh, the Welsh Development Debating Squad uh, this year uh, which I'm really enjoying. So a bit of a context uh, to this lecture before we jump into the actual thoughts I have um, on it. Um, and the first thing to say, and I realize it's rare to say something like this at a start of a lecture, um, but I'm really hopeful that a lot of this lecture will not be relevant or be a lot less relevant than it is at the moment in the future, because obviously we're all really hopeful that in-person competitions can resume quite soon. Um, I think there's a lot of really big advantages from uh, for in-person competitions that we don't quite get uh, with the tournaments being online, like meeting people from all over the world um, and those sorts of things. So a lot of my friends have been from world schools all over the world. I think you don't quite get that same degree of connection with these online competitions. Having said that, though, um, I think it's worth noting that I think online competitions have proven themselves to be really, really useful in the last 18 months or so and specifically for world school style competitions. Um, because I guess if you look at any online competition these days, uh, you're looking at them being a hundred plus teams from literally all over the world with really top tier adjudication calls, really, really great judging pools as well. Um, and so the online competitions have this access to debating that I don't think is present uh, in person um, and therefore I do think to a large degree that because they've been so successful um, and at least for me uh, when I've been judging these competitions the standard of debating because everyone's having this practice all the time getting this fantastic feedback from judges um, I think kids uh, who are debating in the world school style are getting better and better because of these tournaments I think because of that, um, I do think online competitions are very much kind of here to stay. And even when there'll be regional tournaments that will be able to hopefully happen quite soon in person, I think it's highly likely that online competitions do continue in some form or another 
just because they allow this access that you wouldn't otherwise get if you have to have teams traveling all over the world, which is very expensive and those sorts of things. So I think that's the context of this lecture is I think that online competitions will probably still be a thing uh, going forward in debating. What's interesting then, at least from where I'm sitting, is that there's been such a little focus on the whole within debating and within kind of debate education um, on how you approach and how you uh, strategize for these online competitions and what you use similarly and differently from these in-person events. I think this is maybe even the first lecture that kind of directly uh, talks about how you can approach online competitions and how they're a bit different from in-person ones. So in the next 40 minutes or so, um, I'm going to try and just share my thoughts on online debating, what you can do within online competitions to do better in them. I'd like to just finally note within this kind of context part of this lecture um, that I really hope that this lecture is quite kind of collaborative in that all the thoughts in this lecture are very much kind of my opinions of what I've witnessed from online debating. You might have very plausibly other ideas uh, on this. So please do, as you're going th uh, through this lecture, jot down any thoughts that you do have on anything I'm saying. Uh, feel free to ask questions at the end. I've left a bit of uh, time to have a bit of a discussion at the end, because uh, a lot of this is kind of new ground within debating. Uh, so these approaches are very much not kind of the only way of approaching it. And I'm really interested to hear kind of other ideas uh, on this matter as well. So that's how this lecture is broadly going to work. In terms of the uh, kind of actual structure of this, I'm first going to look at uh, how to approach online debating competitions before the competitions them th themselves. Then I'm going to go into before the debate and on the day of the competition, i.e. prep time. Then looking at during the day debate in terms of style and strategy. After that, looking at after the debate. And then, as I said and touched on, uh, I'll leave a bit of time at the end to have questions and a bit of, dis uh, of a discussion about what we've mentioned uh, in this uh, brief uh, kind of chat. So, diving in then to this first point then, before online competitions, I'm going to note that this is probably the most boring part of the lecture, uh, so kind of bear with me on this, but I do think that there's certain things that every team before an online debating competition need to just make sure that they've done uh, to make sure that you don't look uh, a bit foolish uh, when you arrive if you haven't quite uh, done them properly. Very simple things like read the tech briefing, make sure that you've updated your Zoom, generally just be up to date with what you need before that uh, online competition starts. Make sure that you have a microphone and camera that works. The amount of times that you know, I've been there as a judge and someone's got a microphone where you can hardly hear uh, what they're saying. If that's the case in, in your team, make sure to let other people on your team know. Be honest uh, with each other on that to make sure that you have all the kit that you need to, uh, to, to uh, be in these competitions well. I think the most important thing to note on this slide is to have a contingency plan if you disconnect. Um, I hope that you might already even have one of these uh, but to be very explicit about before your competition what your plan of action is if one of your teammates cut out um, because I can guarantee you that you either already have cut out from one of these online competitions mid-speech um, or if you haven't already and that's very lucky I guarantee you that it will happen at least once uh, sometime in the next few competitions that you're doing and it'll often be when you least expect it as well uh, so I was judging a competition, but I did loads of competitions from South Wales, which has really, really bad Wi-Fi. So I was always thinking, oh, I might be cutting out in one of these tournaments. I moved to Oxford University and started this year. Uh, and in Oxford, the Wi-Fi is generally really, really good. So I thought I'd have no problems. But it was in Oxford that uh, the whole building had a power cut, the Wi-Fi cut out. And I was left looking a bit silly because I didn't have a contingency plan. So I was quite frantic about, about what to do. Now, in terms of the actual contingency plan that you guys might have, uh, that's very much up to you. It's very much up to discussion. I'm perfectly happy to have a bit of a conversation about that at the end of this lecture. But from my perspective, I think there's three things that I think you should be doing for an online debating competition in terms of your contingency plan if you cut out. I think the first thing to do if you cut out 
is to message your teammates and let them know that you know you've cut out and you're trying to get back in as soon as you possibly can. I think this is a very important step and it's very important to do first because often in these tournaments, there's quite a set amount of time that judges are able to give to speakers to reconnect. And if they don't reconnect in that time, they're unfortunately uh, forced to kind of continue the debate and mark that speech as a 60, which is the lowest score uh, that you can give a speak. However, what I've noticed is that if judges know, if uh, I as a judge am told by one of your teammates who've, uh, who is, hasn't cut out that, you know, this speaker is trying to get back in the room, I'm much more likely to be quite flexible with that time because if I know that someone's, they know they've cut out, they're doing everything they can to rejoin, I think that's when I'm a little more likely to be flexible. So first things first, message your teammates, let them know uh, that you're, uh, you know, you know you've cut out, you're doing everything you can, and then they can say that to judges. The second thing to say is ideally, I would have another device or another connection uh, where you can uh, take part in the online debating competition. So for instance, when I uh, compete in online debating competitions, I'll have my laptop with Wi-Fi, but I'll also have a backup of my phone with mobile data, which means if one cuts out, the other will be able to, to kind of step in uh, at that point. And I've already got kind of the Zoom links ready for both. So I'm very quick. If one cuts out, I can go straight back onto the, to the other one. So I think that's something to, to, to do second of all. If that's not possible, I think another really nice way to do it is for you to call or phone call one of your teammates. They can put the phone next to the uh, microphone that picks up your speech as normal. So there are the kind of three things I think that you should do if you cut out. And I think that makes sure that you're, you're not uh, kind of losing unnecessary marks within debate. I think the crucial thing to say here is that this process should very much happen before the tournament. So you're able to be proactive when you do cut out because it's kind of inevitable that it will happen at some point. Uh, so if you're ready for that and you have a plan for the tournament, you're not going to be panicking when that does inevitably happen and therefore you can kind of approach it in a productive way. So that's the second thing uh, out of the way in terms of this slide. The last thing I'd say uh, before online tournaments is something that you may not have considered as much as the other two before, but I actually think it's really, really important before the tournament itself, and that's to do some kind of team bonding exercises or kind of just activities as a team that are completely separate from debating. And I think this is often really overlooked, especially in online debating competitions, because if you think about it, online debating competitions are highly intense. They're often very long. They take place, especially the big ones now, they take place over like five or six days where you're debating constantly. They're really draining. They're really intense. Now, in the usual and in-person competitions, uh, you have a lot of time to yourselves as a team that's completely separate from debating, right? You'll go to dinners with them, you'll have nights out with them. There's a lot of time where the chats that you're having with your teammates are literally nothing to do with debating. And that's really refreshing, right? Because it's quite nice to be able to talk to them in a, in a different uh, context, uh, context. So I can't quite recommend enough some sort of team activity before a debating competition uh, takes place. So with Team Wales last year, I know it's uh, more difficult uh, because it's online, but we did a few things. We had an online quiz with the team that was completely separate from debating. We had like a movie night where we were all streaming a film on like Netflix uh, and we were all kind of talking about that. Um, whatever you do, I think it's just worth doing something. Um, and I think it's, although it sounds really small, I just think it's really, really important that you do do something like that. Because if you don't, the literally the only time that you're spending with your teammates is time during debating competitions. And that's kind of terrifying, right? Because debating competitions are so, so intense in different ways. Um, so you're likely to kind of drive each other mad if the only time that you're seeing a person is in a highly stressful debating environment. So I think on the flip side, if you do get to know your teammates in a bit of a different way, 
it builds up teamwork, it builds up kind of team resilience, that sort of thing. You get to know your teammates in a bit of a different sense. You get to trust them more. There's all these things that are completely subconscious but are really important within debating that stem from having a really positive team morale and a positive team uh, kind of experience. And I think a lot of that is developed before an online debating competition. Um, so to have some sort of activity before online competitions is something uh, that I would highly recommend. So just to sum up on that slide, before debating competitions, broadly do three things. Read the tech briefing, have a contingency planning case just in case you do cut out, and have some sort of team bonding activity to make sure that you're getting to know your teammates in a bit of a different way from just debating. So moving on then, the actual debate, before the debate, specifically preparation time. I think there's broadly five things to note on preparation time uh, with online debating competitions um, in particular. I think the first thing to note is that you should definitely do all the classic things that you would do at an online, uh, sorry, an in-person debating competition, like asking motion clarifications, that sort of thing. None of that changes. If you have any problems with motion, any queries, any anything, make sure that you do still uh, ask that. A member of the adjudication call will be there to assist you with that. So it's definitely worth doing and getting that out of the way early. None of that changes. I think what does change within these online debating competitions is two quite important things. The first thing is it becomes a lot more difficult within online debating competitions um, to make sure that everyone is kind of on the same page. Uh, so, you know, it's often very, when you're physically separated from one another, working as a team just becomes that much more difficult, right? So. What I've noticed is that it's really easy for one or two members to kind of get lost. So I was speaking third in one round at World Schools last year. My first and second speakers kind of decided something about the team strategy and I just didn't quite pick up on it because I just wasn't on the same page as my, as my teammates. And I've also noticed that it's really easy for one member or two members or even three members um, to not really contribute as much as they would do in an in-person discussion. Uh, because Zoom makes it quite difficult to have all members of the team really contributing in a productive way. So ensuring that everyone is contributing is another thing to think about with these, with these online formats. I've also noticed that it's also quite difficult to, you know, work in, in kind of groups, often in preparation time in, in person. Uh, the team, at least with Wales, would split in half. Two members might prep the other side's case, think of rebuttal, three members might focus on our constructive matter. Um, you're really unable to do that when you're all just in one Zoom breakout room and the kind of you can't have two separate conversations going on. So in light of that, how do you kind of minimize these kind of things and make sure that you are still able to make good use of that preparation time? I think I have four suggestions. The first thing, and I think this is uh, done by quite a few teams, is to have a kind of Google document open during preparation time that one person types everyone's ideas onto and then everyone's thoughts are there very neatly um, in one place. I think that's a very uh, useful uh, way to make sure that you have kind of everything that you need in the same place and everyone knows where you're going at, at different points in time. I think in lots of ways, it's actually quite, use, uh, quite similar to having a whiteboard maybe in preparation time, which, which often we'd have in an in-person competition. Uh, so you can all look at the whiteboard. You all know exactly what your arguments are, what your team's thoughts are and those sorts of things. So that can be really, really useful. I also think it, it's useful, and this is specific to online debating competitions, is that if you have a Google doc or something like that to always refer to within uh, these sorts of things, you can actually refer back to it after prep time has ended and after the debate, right? So you can evaluate how your preparation time had, had gone. Um, and I think that's really useful, right? Because one of the uh, points in debates that we, I think, scrutinize least is the preparation time because coaches are obviously not able to sit in on that. They can ask the team how it went. But beyond that, there's no real scrutiny or, or level of kind of improvement for the team within preparation time oftentimes. So it can be quite nice to just have a bit of a record so we can say, right, well, here, 
with the Google Doc shows us that we went wrong here in preparation time. We need to spend a bit more time on this, this certain thing or that certain thing. So referring back to it and, and really being able to track back your train of thought in that preparation period is, is something that is, is actually quite useful. So that's the first thing tip I'd have. In preparation time, someone shares their screen, you all then have a, a doc that you have access to, and then you can go from there. The second thing that I think I'd say in terms of uh, preparation time is I think whoever's leading the preparation time, if you've got a team captain or something like that, needs to be very, very good at communicating with others and very, very good at making an inclusive environment where everyone feels comfortable to contribute to that discussion. They need to make sure that everyone knows what's going on at different times. They need to make sure that everyone is contributing so you can always collaborate as a team. And it also needs to be an environment, and this is quite difficult, where you as a team know that if a member has a problem or doesn't quite understand something, that they can uh, talk about that. They can say that we need to have uh, five or 10 minutes to sort out this sort of thing. So I think it's very easy if you're speaking in a debating round in an online competition and you're panicking about something, it's quite difficult to say that, right? When you're sat on your own, it's much easier in an in-person competition because you're just sat right next to your, to your teammates. You can have them help you and those, those sorts of things. So making sure that you have that atmosphere within preparation time is something that I think you should all work on uh, because I think it's really, really important. The third thing I'd say is I think all the communication should happen very centrally and it should all happen as a team rather than just individuals. Because I think it's very tempting uh, in prep time to, you know, if you've thought of something, to message one of your teammates to talk about it with them. And then if they agree with you, and maybe it's the kind of person you're closest with on the team because you've known them before or something, then you take it to the rest of the team and talk about it with them. But I really, really, really wouldn't recommend this because it kind of wastes everyone's time, right? Because you should be discussing everything fully as a team because it's a, a, really a team game. So making sure that all the discussions happen centrally or happen together as a team is something that I, I really would recommend, um, especially because that's what would happen in an in-person competition. I think the final thing that I just quickly note um, about preparation time is I think it's probably a good idea to let people have some silent time. Uh, so often when I'd be writing out my arguments so at the end of preparation time, for instance, if I was speaking first in a debate, um, other members talking, them discussing rebuttal or something on the Zoom call uh, would really irritate me. I wouldn't be able to concentrate and write my own arguments. So I think it's more than fair enough to have some, have some sort of strategy whereby one person is able to kind of put that computer on mute uh, and say to the team, I'm gonna mute you guys just five minutes, just have some silent time to myself, just to think of this sort of thing, uh, but still to have some way of contacting that person, right? So if I would do that, I'd always make sure that my phone was not on silent. So if there was something big, uh, a big issue in the team that needed to be discussed, they could still get hold of me and I could jump back into that discussion. So I think it's just worth thinking about those sorts of things. So that's, I guess, the main ways I think preparation time can be a bit more different in online debating competitions. But if you do have a Google Doc, so you know wh where everything is at all times, if you have that atmosphere where everyone still feels that like they're able to contribute and knows what's going on, if all the communication is centralized, so you're discussing everything in, uh, as a team, and then if you also have a bit of time and a bit of a willingness to let people have some silent time to gather their thoughts themselves. It still can be a very productive uh, preparation time, although that you're all physically separated from one another um, and although that you're all on Zoom. So I think those are the ways that I thought of in terms of preparation time that you can improve. Um, but feel free to, to let me know at the end of the session if you have any other thoughts on preparation time. I'd be really interested to hear that. So moving on then, during the actual debate. Look, if you love it or hate it, I know some people have very strong opinions of this. Uh, style is a big part of world schools debating. Uh, I don't see it going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and some judges, and I think some more than others, uh, take style into account a hell of a lot. And 
well, literally, you could be winning or losing a debate based on your style. So it's really, really important in all debating. But in online debating, I think it, it, it's a bit different uh, with style, but I think still very, very important, as I'll come on to say. So I think there's four things that I like to observe about style during online tournaments in particular. First is just please have your cameras on. Um, if it's possible for you, unless your internet connection is genuinely so awful that you can only get involved uh, with voice, turning your cameras on when you're speaking and also in other times within the debate, I think is just really, really important. Because if you look at pretty much every piece of research that talks about communication and how we understand each other and those sorts of things, it says that it's not just about audible cues, it's about visual ones as well. So, so much of understanding other people and, and getting what the gist of what they're saying is, is seeing you being able to communicate that and picking up on those non-audible sorts of cues. Uh, so I literally can't recommend having your camera on enough just so people in the room understand what you're saying more. So I think that's a really important thing. I'd also just note from a judge's perspective that like I'm a hundred times more bored in a speech that has their camera off than I am in a speech that has their camera on. I think it just, to me, hearing someone's voice is quite monotonous. It's quite dull. So I'm likely to be just more engaged as a judge, more likely to track everything they're saying, taking it really seriously uh, if they have their cameras on so I can kind of empathize with what they say. I'd also recommend that you keep your cameras on for the duration of the debate. I think that's also kind of good practice. I think there's broadly two reasons for that. First is I just think it humanizes debating, right? Uh, it makes it more lively. It makes it seem like more of an in-person event uh, that we all miss. So I think that's a good thing to have within online debating. I think the second reason is you can also react to one another because um, I don't think you can really underestimate the subconscious importance to a judge of kind of me nodding at one of my teammates when they're talking because it kind of legitimizes what they're saying or equally when your opponents are saying something that you don't agree with to you know give a bit of a hmm or some sort of indication that you don't really agree fully with what they're saying obviously you don't go over the top with that it's very easy to go over the top with that but I think it's, it's, it's often quite nice to have that engagement um, and it does help as a judge just to, you know, draw attention to certain things. It helps with strategy as well. So I think just having your camera on when your teammates are, are, are talking, having a bit of a, hmm, uh, giving it a bit of a nod and those sorts of things has actually a big impact on judges uh, subconsciously. So I think that's worth, worth talking about. Second thing I'd say and this is speak slower. This is just my kind of observation, but I, th I think, and this is just my argument, world schools debaters are now speaking on average faster than they were at the start of the pandemic. Um, and I think that's, there's a few reasons that might explain that. I think one is that people have more practice in it now. Uh, people are debating in general a lot more because online competitions are so accessible. So they're able to just say more within eight minutes. So what's expected of a first prop speaker now is just a bit more intense than it was a year ago or two years ago, where you could get away with just saying a bit less. But I also think it's because a lot of kind of world schools uh, competitions now have uh, judges from British parliamentary style formats who are able to track things a lot quicker because of the nature of those competitions, uh, whereby people, you know, speak faster, style is less of a big deal. Um, I think speaking really, really fast in an online format, though, is kind of a recipe for disaster. Um, because that's not just because world in world schools format, it's just a good idea to speak slowly to get those style marks, which judges do uh, credit a lot. But I think more importantly, and this is even if you don't kind of agree with that, uh, bit of thinking in an online competition in an online format people are just going to understand way way less of your speech than they would do in an in-person competition right because if you think about it your voice is literally having to travel 
into a microphone and then through a load of like underground wires and then into your computer screen where it's going to sound like 20% more robotic than it actually is in reality. There's also likely to be certain words, certain sentences that are inevitably going to kind of cut out within your speech. So on the whole, you're likely to be just a bit less understandable in an online format than you would be uh, within an in-person one. The impact of that is, if you speak really fast during an online competition, everyone in the room is not going to understand certain bits of what you're saying. That's bad, obviously, because it means judges aren't picking up on important arguments and just aren't crediting your material as much as they should do. And that's really bad, I've certainly seen it happen. But it's also bad because the team kind of opposite you and the team against you also is not unlikely to understand everything that you're saying within your speech. And that means they're not able to respond to those arguments fully. And at that point, basically the whole debate becomes a very dull version of you didn't respond to this, you didn't respond to this, rather than kind of a clean debate with very clear clashes and both teams engaging within those. So I guess TLDR, speak 10%, 15%, maybe, maybe even more slower than you would in an in-person competition because it's really important that you do maintain that kind of level of understanding. Uh, people can understand what you're saying within. That. The third thing I'd like to note under this is that I really encourage you to still do all the stylistic things that you would do at an in-person competition during an online competition. Because uh, I'm not going to lie, when I started debating online last year, I naturally kind of toned down my style big time because I just found it really cringeworthy to think that I'd be saying a really emotive story or getting really passionate about something or shouting out my screen when I was just talking at a screen and I thought it was especially true when I thought that my parents who were downstairs might be able to hear me doing that. I just found it really weird um, at the, the, the start. But since I've started judging these online competitions this year, I've realized I was really, really, really wrong in doing that. I still should have kept on doing style just as much as I was doing in person for these online debating events. Because I think if anything, making full use of style is even more important now during online competitions than it was during in-person events. Because I can now confirm that when you're judging the fourth round of the day on an online competition, when it's dark outside and you're really tired, it's really, really easy to get bored and start turning off. And that's true because I know it's hard to keep track of this, but the people judging you in debates are still humans, right? Um, so if you speak a bit like this and add no emotion into your voice, I'm going to be judging that debate. I'm going to be wanting to die inside and go to sleep rather than kind of listen to your listen to your speech track everything that you're saying and uh, making sure that i am considering all of those points but i also would note that i think you're likely to be also less invested in what you're saying when you're a bit less confident uh, in your style so when you're getting really engaged it makes you feel that the material you're delivering is more true right and that can come over and you can say it in a lot more expressive and a lot more better way. So I guess TLDR then, make sure you're still being really lively. Make sure you're still using all of those tools from your style toolbox. Um, sure, you might sound a bit silly to anyone else in the house or even to yourself, but that's worth it because your speech will become so much more engaging and you'll make sure that everyone in the room and crucially the judges in that room are going to be paying full attention to what you're saying and the content that you're delivering. So making sure that you're still 
uh, bang on with startup. It's really important. The final thing I'd like to touch on within this is your lighting and background. Uh, because I know it might sound a bit ridiculous, but I actually do think it's quite important within online debating competitions. I also realize I've done quite a terrible job at it here. Um, I'm not where I usually would be at, um, at home uh, because my, my sister's hogging the main room, but um, having really good lighting uh, is actually quite uh, important. I think it's one of those things that you don't really notice it unless it's kind of extremely good or extremely bad. But if it is extremely good or extremely bad, um, I think it's quite disastrous and everyone will definitely notice it. Um, so like, I don't know, if I'm judging someone, and I can literally only see like the top, far, the top part of their face, like their nose up. I'm gonna be spending the entirety of that speech trying not to laugh um, instead of trying, uh, like tracking what they're saying and making sure that I'm paying attention to all of their points. Right? You know, I myself have had a bit of a nightmare with this. This is maybe something to think about. Um, but I also didn't realize and didn't really pay attention to the fact that lighting changes a lot at, at different points in the day. So at pre-WSDC online last year, um, it was sunset in Wales. I just had this huge amount of orange light just kind of illuminating my face. It was apparently so distracting to see for everyone in that room. And my coaches were really angry because they spent the whole time kind of ranting to each other about how absurd I was looking. And I think everyone was really distracted at that. And then therefore they were spending a lot less time thinking about what I was actually saying uh, within that speech. Um, equally though, if you get it right, I think it looks really awesome. Um, so I still remember the kids who've got, you know, really professional looking setups, got beautiful lighting. Sometimes they've got, you know, team's flags behind them and it looks really cool um, and I really enjoy listening to those speakers speak right because it seems like a nice experience for me um, and it's really easy to take those those speakers seriously and to think a lot about what they're saying so I guess the thing to stress here is make sure that you figure out what your lighting and background is making sure that it's nice making sure that it isn't disastrous and that ideally making it quite professional and quite nice to look at for judges. Um, I think that's another thing uh, that is worth mentioning. Okay, moving on also during the debate then to strategy. I think the main thing to observe here is that it's much, much harder to help each other out during the debate in, in, uh, in online competitions than it would be at in-person equivalent competitions uh, because during in-person events, right, you can literally just pass a sheet of rebuttal to your teammates and say, read this out. And then I've literally done that in speeches. It's great. If you've got a really, really smart member, they can give you everything you need. And that's really great. During the first few online competitions, I think this is what I struggled with most, right? Because I felt so much more alone, uh, like I had to do everything within that speech for myself. And that was just generally a more difficult experience for me. But however, I do think that there are still ways to make sure that you all make use of each other during online debating competitions, because after all, debating is, you know, a team sport. For instance, communicating with one another from your team's WhatsApp group, Facebook group, whatever you, you have. I guess the only thing I would say is maybe don't have a kind of Zoom private message going on between you, because uh, that can go dramatically wrong if the other team sees everything that you're sending or something like that. But whatever it is, I think there's two ways that you can broadly make use of your team's WhatsApp group or whatever in online debating competitions. I think the first way is just to use it for kind of the big things that you pick up on during the debate that are equally relevant for all the speeches in the rounds, so like big pieces of battle huge strategic flaws on the other side's case that everyone needs to be aware of. Definitely make use of those, definitely put them on the WhatsApp group, those things. But I think I'd take it a bit further than that. And this is what we did in the competitions leading up to World Schools. It really, really helped me out during those speeches is to get your teammates to help you track and think of responses for individual speeches. So for instance, before second proposition, first and third help out with the second speaker. 
I think there's a few ways you can do this. I think you can either just help that speaker in terms of tracking what the previous speaker is saying. So they can track first op. This is what my preference would be, by the way. I'd be frantically tracking, think of our responses. It would be really handy for just my first speaker to send me and say, by the way, here's what the argument first op is getting at. Here's the mechanisms that they used. And I'd be able to sort of see, right, oh, I missed that mechanism, right, that's really handy. I can then think of a response to that. Equally though, sometimes it's further to go, it's useful to go even further than that and get your partners to literally hand you four pieces of rebuttal, for instance, on your team sport group. Um, coming back to the idea that debating to team sport, it, you've, if you're doing that, you have you know three times as many minds and clever people working on coming up with rebuttal as you would do if you were there on your own. And you're likely to have those different perspectives bouncing off each other. That's likely to be really productive and really great, especially when you're not able to uh, come up with all of those points on your own. So it's definitely worth working as a team and coming up with all of those points uh, collaboratively. Just before I move on to the next point within, within this, I just want to observe two things about kind of working as a team to come up with these points. I think the first thing to observe, and I really hope that this kind of goes without saying, but I do think it's genuinely very useful that you do pass down responses as a team. Like, I know there's speaker rankings and individual speaker scores and those sorts of things. They shouldn't be important to you, by the way, because speaks are so arbitrary. Um, and there's a whole variety of reasons that I could rant to you about why speaker scores I don't think are, are highly reflective of ability. For instance, I think there's often biases towards third speakers. I think it's probably true that they benefit uh, certain individuals from certain countries more than they do from others. There's a whole range of reasons why speaks are often not so reflective of ability. What should be important to you is working as a team and sending responses to each other and helping each other out is obviously good in terms of that. But even if those speaker tabs and things are important to you, notice that if you're speaking third and you say a response, third op picks up on it, destroys it, then it's out of the debate. You can't win the debate based on that. Whereas if you say that response in second, so you've passed it to your second speaker, second op tries to get away with responding to it, you're able to defend that point and say why that response isn't relevant in third, and therefore you've evolved the case a lot more down the line, and that's really, really useful in terms of making sure that you, that you have everything that you need. So notice how it's then not just beneficial to the team that you're passing their responses, but it's actually beneficial to you as well. So I think that's the first thing, uh, first thing to observe. I think the second thing to observe about this is don't overuse the WhatsApp group and don't kind of oversend messages on it. I know this is, is maybe will come across a bit contradictory for me, but I do think there's a fine line between communicating enough on that WhatsApp group and over communicating to the extent that you almost can't think because there's so much information being bombarded at you that often a speaker will just not look at it at all and just go back to working on their, their own. I think one way to get over this, and we can maybe discuss this bit at the end, um, is maybe if you do, say there's three speakers on the team, you're about to start second prop. First and third, maybe discuss rebuttal with each other first, and then anything they agree on and only those points they send on to second prop. So they're only points that are on the WhatsApp group, on the final one that second prop sees, are the most important things that has to go in their speech. That's something to discuss. But I do think it's definitely worth you helping each other with uh, coming up with responses and those sorts of things. But it is a fine line to make sure that you don't do it too much. So I think that's really, really important. And I'd just like to note here as well, that it's particularly important because although a lot of speakers and a lot of teams within world schools and online debating competitions will have three different devices or five different devices you're going to be competing against some teams who are fortunate enough to be able to all be in the same place at the same time they'll be debating off one computer and they'll be able to do prep time with each other they'll be able to do the debate with one another 
And that puts them at a real advantage because they're able to communicate things with each other during the debate. So making sure you can do that too, for instance, with a WhatsApp group, is something that I think is really, really useful to touch on. Moving on then. The second thing to note really quickly on strategy within the debate is on points of information. I think there's broadly two things that I'd like to touch on here. Um, first of all is in terms of offering POIs, offer POIs, they're really useful. They show engagement. You can catch speakers out, they're great. And judges do take note of POIs and we think they're important. So if you can offer a killer POI, you should definitely. Um, I notice it's, I recognize it's a bit more awkward to offer a POI in online debating because if you've got to unmute your mic, say points of information right into the chat, whatever. It's much easier to just in person and in real life, just stand up or put your hand up and say point of information. However, you should still be doing it because it's really, really important. And if you're able to be very clearly offering points of information, that's really good practice. The second thing to observe here though, is in terms of being offered POIs, this is maybe where I'm gonna be most controversial and put myself out there most within this lecture. But I would firmly recommend that you take POIs either in the chat or with camera, but not with people unmuting themselves and saying point of information. I think the reason for that is I think it can actually be a big disadvantage to you when you have someone else's audio on during your speech. Because that's not just because some teams, and you can let your mind imagine which teams I'm talking about here, are very strong. I would say point of information very loudly, and that can be very distracting to you. But it can also kind of delegitimize what you're saying. When someone's saying point of information or point of information, it to, to a judge seems to kind of delegitimize what you're saying that slight bit. So I think if you can avoid that, that's a really good thing. But it also kind of messes up people's audio, right? When you're saying point of information really loudly, so if someone's cutting across what I'm saying right now, you're unlikely to be able to make out what I'm saying to them at that same degree. So I think, obviously, if you are unable to do this, your connection, uh, you know, you're on your phone, so you can't see people raising their hand if they have their cameras on, or I don't know if you aren't reading the chats because that's not what you do, that sort of thing. Maybe that's the only alternative that, that you have left. But if you're able to not have to rely on verbal POIs, I think I definitely would. I think the final thing to say here really briefly is just like, make sure you do take points of information. Um, if they're not being offered, politely ask the other team to engage with you. Um, Maybe not if it's a clearly weak team and they're unable to come up with them. But I do think it's worth engaging, making sure that POI is offered. That's something that I would definitely do. Finally then, and quite briefly, what would I say about after the debate? I think there's broadly three things I'd say after the debate. The first thing I say is after the debate, I highly recommend that you unmute yourself, keep your cameras on, and have a chat with the other team in the room. There's some classic questions that you guys can ask about the other team to get to know them a bit. You can exchange social medias, those sorts of things. But I do think it's just a lovely thing to be able to do. If you can have some friends that you've made from online debating competitions, it just makes the whole experience, especially in the pandemic where we can't meet any other people in person. It makes it a lot more pleasant of an experience I found. So it was really great from where I was standing. Uh, team Wales came really, really close with like Team South Africa. We came really close with Team Netherlands. We had a few debates with the Slovenian contingent as well. Getting to know them was actually really nice and it humanized debating a bit more. So I'd highly recommend you do that. Be the ones that are being proactive. It might be a bit awkward at the start, but you know, it just, rather than just spending the whole online debating competition debating getting feedback debating getting feedback if you can get to know some people i think that's really good and i think it kind of gives yourself a break as well highly recommend that i think the second thing that i'd say here is make sure that you make full use of feedback from top tier judges because some of the judges that are 
judging at these competitions are genuinely phenomenal. They've been around and debating for ages. They've been in hundreds of debates and they've picked up a load of tips from some of the best debaters, not just in the school circuit, but also in the university circuit as well. So sticking around, even if you're really tired and really bored at the end of the day, I highly recommend you just stick around for that extra 10 to 20 minutes to listen out for their top quality feedback and to implement that in, in your own speeches. That's really something that I think is exclusive to often to online competitions when they're able to get really amazing judges from all over the world. I think the final thing to note here is just to be really nice and polite to the judges, right? So for instance, in feedback, keep your cameras on, like nod at what they're saying during their reasoning for decision. So you are engaging with them. It just makes judges feel better, right? When I'm not feeling like I'm speaking to a screen. Um, and I think it's often quite, you know, it's often quite a weird experience for me when teams do stick around and they say, yeah, we'd love some personal feedback, but then they leave their cameras off. So I'm sat there like, I've got literally no idea if you're actually listening to, to my feedback or if I'm completely wasting my time and you guys are actually kind of watching television, not listening to it, on mute, whatever, right? So I think if you do have your cameras on, it just makes judges feel better. Um, I think the importance of that, just beyond making feel, people feel good, which is a good thing, is like from your own incentives, it's literally the same like 30 to 50 judges that are judging every single debating competition at the moment. So like I'm judging with the same people. You look at the tabs, there's the same individuals who are basically at all these competitions, give or take one or two in one combination or the other, you're going to be judged by like someone like me because I'm doing quite a lot of them. There's other people like me who are judging also quite a lot of them. So you want to keep them on your side. You want them to think that you're a nice team. Um, often if a team, you know, storms off after feedback, they're very clear that they don't agree with the decision or something. I'm not going to really like that team. Like if I judge them again, I'm not going to actively be out to get them. But subconsciously, I'm going to feel a bit less positively towards that team rather than if your team is really lovely. They keep their cameras on. They seem really grateful for feedback. They seem to be engaging with you you know, that just makes me feel good. And therefore, if I judge them again, I look forward to judging them again. I look forward to the speeches that they have to offer. So it's again, one of these really small things and it's something that kind of is subconscious to judges. Um, and But I do think because we're all human uh, as judges, it's something that also is quite important to note. So after the debate, keep your cameras on, get to know the other team, get feedback, be polite, that sort of thing. I don't think it, it, it's worth overestimating how important that can be. So yeah, thank you. That's Those are my thoughts on kind of online debating as a whole. Um, we've got a few minutes now, if you uh, want to ask some questions or some comments or anything that you want to engage with, with what I've said, because as I say, a lot of my thoughts are very much my opinions that I've picked up from online debating. So I'd really like to hear um, other thoughts that you might have. Uh, so yes. I'll give you an opportunity to do that now. Well, I have a question if uh, no one else wants to jump in, uh, sure, which is, is there anything we can learn from online debating in terms of style, for example, that we can also use in in-person debating? Yeah, definitely. Um, so in terms of style in particular, um, I think it's, everything is a bit more extreme in online debating. Um, and I think you notice good style or bad style a lot more uh, because what makes an engaging speaker in an online debating tournament uh, is quite a skill. And I think it's very easy to not have so great style in online competitions and be, being quite boring as, as well. And that's true for a lot of speakers. Um, so I guess picking up on what makes a really interesting speech and looking out for those sorts of things when you are competing uh, in online competitions is actually a really, really useful way for you then to go back to in-person events and doing exactly the same. Uh, so I think that's the, the main thing I'd say is 
for speakers that you really, really like listening to in online debating competitions, think about what are they doing really well? How can I replicate that? How can I put that into action when in-person competitions get back to being reality? So yeah, if there's not any further questions, I realize we're fast running out of time. Uh, so I think it might be worth wrapping up there. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, I hope it's been somewhat useful to pick up on some things uh, for online debating competitions. And uh, best of luck to any tournaments you do do. And if I do judge you in one of those, uh, I'll be glad to see you. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for coming. All right, thanks everybody else. Um, Thank you for coming for this. Thank you for coming to this one. Of course, we also have the archive of all workshops that you can watch. And we can also tell others to watch. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.